just to give a, a brief uh, summary, the Center for Open Science uh, is re new, relatively new. So we founded in January 2013, and our initial funding uh, was in March. Uh, and the origins are from uh, just work that we were doing uh, in the laboratory. So my, I, I have been uh, a faculty member at the University of Virginia since 2002, uh, working on uh, uh, research in, on the gap between values and practices, what we think we should do, what we're trying to do, what we would like to do versus what we actually do. Uh, and a lot of the work that I had been doing in the lab and my lab had been doing is on the methodology of science. How can we do science better? How can we continue to work on the practices of trying to make our research uh, more reproducible, more reliable, more robust uh, for application and other things? Uh, and uh, in 2011, uh, we started a couple of projects uh, that were in the, examining something that had become a very prominent uh, discussion, which is the science that's being done may not be as reproducible as we think uh, it is. Uh, things get published, but published doesn't equal true. Uh, there's a lot of things that may get published, and the effects that observed in that publication may be more beautiful than the reality uh, of the investigation itself, uh, and then even the promise for actually being uh, something real and applicable and extendable uh, in interesting ways. Uh, but the data it, it was, is incomplete uh, on understanding the challenges of reproducibility. So we started a research project uh, where we said, well, let's investigate how reproducible the published science is, and so let's try to replicate a sample of studies from our domain, uh, psychological science. Uh, and we, can't, we don't have the resources to do it all ourselves, uh, so let's see if others in our community are interested in joining up uh, and working together on this. And so we started a project called the Reproducibility Project, and uh, we defined a protocol. Uh, we sort of set up what the process of identifying studies uh, and trying to reproduce those studies, doing it as robustly and reliably as we could, um, <clears throat> and then asked if anybody else was interested in getting involved. And there was a very rapid reaction. A lot of people got involved very quickly. We had 80 uh, different labs become collaborators in a short period of time. Uh, and uh, and then it got a lot of interest from people that weren't just involved in the project. So uh, a journalist for science uh, was very interested in the project and said, well, I want to report on this even though it's, we don't have results, just the process of doing it. Uh, and so that uh, led us to think, well, there's a lot here. People are interested in these issues. And at the same time, a grad student working in the lab named Jeff Spees uh, he and I were talking about what dissertation project uh, he might pursue, and there's lots of different options. He's a quantitative uh, psychologist, so he's thinking about sort of standard uh, methodology kinds of uh, uh, dissertations, uh, and we're looking at, we have lots of big data in our lab, and so he's looking at things that he might do with that. Uh, but we kept returning to a common interest, which was maybe we can build out a tool uh, where people can uh, practice more the way we think science ought to operate. Uh, that they can document their workflow, they can manage their files, they can make things more publicly available, uh, and that might help facilitate increases in reproducibility. So sort of a practical application idea of let's build tools that might help uh, researchers and an investigation of how, is there really a problem that we need to be worrying about. Uh, and so we were starting to do both of those things just as a lab uh, project, uh, and then uh, once there was some media interest, then we started getting a lot of interest from others, uh, and particularly funders calling and saying, we're, we're interested in the work you're doing. Tell us more about what you're doing. We said, oh, we'd be happy to tell you about what we're doing. Uh, so the origins uh, of what we were doing really started with a problem. Uh, and the problem that we were, we were thinking we wanted to try to help solve, and this was you know, not thinking grandiose. This was our lab doing it for our own purposes and maybe some people around us that would be interested. Uh, but it was really to address the challenges of openness. Uh, the, the, one of the core values of science is that you get to see the basis of all the claims that are made. Uh, so I make a scientific claim. What that means is that you see the methods that I used, the data that I gathered, uh, and the way in which I made that interpretation in order to make that claim uh, so that you can challenge it, you can extend it, you can refute it, whatever it is you want to do with that, it's, it has to be out there 
in order for it to be a basis of uh, sort of accumulating evidence uh, for different claims. Uh, and in practice, what happens is that you see my report of what I did. This is the advertising for what I learned in the research that I did in the lab. Uh, but you don't actually get access to the methodology itself uh, or the data or any other sort of components of the workflow that generated those findings that came out of the lab. Uh, but now we live in an age where it's actually possible to show a lot of more of that evidence, a lot more of that workflow because we can code it digitally and there's these amazing tubes that send information everywhere uh, so that you can see it. Uh, and so that uh, opens up an opportunity to make science more closer to its ideal of opening up that workflow so people can see the research. There's another aspect of openness in science that is important to us as well. So openness as transparency is that core theme. The second theme of openness is inclusivity. That science in principle is everybody's, right? It's a community good. Uh, and so anyone should be able to evaluate, contribute, question, whatever, what is happening in the scientific process. But we know in practice that science is quite exclusive, right? The getting involved and in actually doing research uh, requires being at a research intensive institution or uh, in an environment that has a lot of resources devoted to the conduction of research. And so one of the values we were trying to pursue with like the reproducibility project is find ways that anyone that has the motivation, the interest, the desire, some general set of skills uh, could contribute to this project in some way give people more access points to getting involved in the science rather than having the good fortune of being in a place that has the resources to, once you get into that pipeline, it's easy to stay in that pipeline. Uh, and there are many different, you know, you have examples of these. There's many different organizations that are trying to increase uh, the access uh, to being involved uh, in the scientific process. So that is the uh, problem origin. Uh, and we didn't imagine initially uh, forming as a nonprofit, but rather just work on the problem as academics work on problems. They work real hard and they get very little done. Uh, and, but then once the funders started calling, we realized that we had a different kind of opportunity, which would be actually transform this into an organization that is a mission-driven organization. Uh, and so we, the center you know, is founded based on its mission, right? improve openness, integrity, and reproducibility of scientific research. Uh, and everything drives from uh, the mission. And so I can just give you sort of a few key um, bits of information, uh, and then maybe it will be sort of start to move to be useful to think about why this kind of model uh, versus others. So we are a 501c3. Uh, we are functionally a technology startup. We do some science, uh, but you know, two thirds, three quarters of our team are, are working on infrastructure development, building tools. Uh, we incorporated in 2013, as I mentioned. Uh, there are now s six different funders, uh, total commitments at 13 million. Uh, and it's a fully FOSS technology shop, so all free open source software. We're not developing any intellectual property for the center. Uh, we are building tools that are intended to be the community's tools, uh, and then we help maintain uh, and foster those. Uh, and the activities I mentioned were mostly technology, so most of the team is doing uh, infrastructure development. But the other two groups, the meta science group is running these crowdsourcing research projects like the reproducibility project. We started in psychology. We now have a similar one in cancer biology, trying to replicate uh, study, 50 studies uh, that are prominent high impact work in that field. Uh, and we're developing additional ones. Lots of people in other communities are saying, we want to do this in economics, in ecology and these places. And so we're sort of at the very, we don't have expertise in all of those, but we're, we, we know stuff about how to coordinate teams and sort of operate these kinds of projects. And then we depend on the domain experts for the actual execution. Uh, and then the community team uh, is mostly scientists, but it's trying to work on uh, the, um, the fact that these, these problems, the challenges for addressing these problems are not located in any uh, one stakeholder or part of the scientific community. They're, all the stakeholders, the entire uh, ecology of the system uh, is, is creating these incentives where uh, my success as a practicing researcher depends on me getting published, not on me getting it right. Uh, and so the more that I can get published and I prioritize getting published, uh, the more likely I am to thrive in the career even if that's at the expense of the accuracy, the reproducibility, the generalizability of the research that I'm pursuing. Uh, and I, don't, I want to 
find out true things. Uh, that's why most scientists, I think, got into doing science. Uh, but I also want to keep my job. Uh, I also want to get, you know, get tenure. All of these other fac practices that are important factors for continuing to be a scientist don't always align with the reality of what happens uh, in the lab. A lot of stuff doesn't work. It doesn't work out the way it is. It isn't very publishable. And so I have strong incentives that might push me to make that a prettier picture than it, should, than it is in reality in order to, to meet my objectives. And so the community team is working with the variety of stakeholders to try to think about how do we nudge these incentives uh, to realign it so that my success uh, in science is aligned with pursuing science in the way that we idealize it. Yes, please. Why are you really curious how that works? And if, it's, if you're going to cover this, um, I can pull my questions. No, please, I prefer you questions. Know, what is the impetus for your funders funding you? I mean, do they want to um, perhaps change the equation so what's publishable is something of more integrity, and integrity, not necessarily success? Because it just seems to me that we're now with a lot of funding in decreasing more pressure. pressure yeah. not to be, to not be untruthful, but push the edge of like integrity and truthfulness in order to get that next round of funding because it's not just sustaining researchers themselves, it's sustaining the company's lives. Yeah. So, yeah. so I'm curious about kind of that, that whole, the whole cycle because it seems like a vicious cycle. Yeah, yeah, it is. And uh, if I could characterize their motivations, which they would characterize better, but at least the way we've talked about it, with all of them ha share a common theme, which is uh, we're mostly foundation funded. We have uh, NIH funding now, the latest grant, um, but mostly it's uh, private foundations. And all of them have a portfolio of things that they're investing in uh, to try to address uh, criminal justice issues, education, poverty, you know, all the, all the standard big problems uh, that foundations care about. Um, and the ones that are supporting us care about research. They want to use the best evidence to solve the problems that they're facing. And this reproducibility crisis or concern makes them say, if we can't trust the evidence, you know, we're dumping billions of dollars into these problems we're not going to get the return on the investment. Now, they're not talking about monetary return. They're talking about impact, right? We want to actually solve these problems. And so we need a reliable research base. We know that science is the best way to do it if science is working well. If it's not working well, we're just throwing our money uh, at problems, and who knows what will happen. Uh, we just will have to get lucky. Uh, and so that's sort of the rationale, is I think they see this as really investing for the future success of what is their core mission, of trying to make uh, the, address the social problems of the day, mm -hmm. um, and uh, so that's so like one the Arnold Foundation is our biggest funder, the Laura and John Arnold Foundation, relatively new. They're f just four years old, uh, based in Houston. Uh, we are part of their research integrity uh, priority of their five different uh, uh, funding priorities. Mm -hmm. um, so that I, maybe that's addressing it. Maybe there's more. Uh, yeah, on the I'm question. just curious. Like Starts to change the uh, equation. Yeah. We could, we could look at the success of past five countries and say there's going to be a lot less of the sustainability and sustainability deal with the problems that we're trying to deal with. So I'm just kind of curious. Yeah. Um, yeah. The, I mean, the pace of science is, is so fast now. Uh, you know, there are more uh, articles published in the last 20 years than in the prior 400. Uh, so that there is just an, an, an because it's now very efficient to produce science, right? There's so much that can be done so rapidly, uh, and the competition is very strong, and it's become internationalized. It's not just a few uh, wealthy nations that are doing it. There's a lot more contributors uh, to the process, and so the the pace is, if anything, just so fast that it might actually be too fast. Uh, and so a number of people that are you know commentators on the scientific process are saying what we actually need to do is slow down. Instead of rushing to publication, we need to take the time, put a little bit more, do less, uh, but get more out of it. What, I don't know if that's the right solution. I think that's, there is wisdom in that, in the sense that you know, if we're just pushing the stuff out the door as fast as we can, then we're not actually sort of building cumulatively on a phenomenon. Um, 
but the uh, but I I think there we're at a you know this is spe more speculation than evidence based but we're at a floor where there is lots of room to become more efficient with the same number of dollars uh, so even if those total dollars are declining I think we can take a, just a few steps and it's not a radical change to the environment other than a conceptual change uh, that in practice, if we just do a few things differently, uh, I think we will get a dramatic increase in the actual effectiveness uh, of the research as we do it. Um, you know, the, but the but the, the funder's expectations for us are uh, relatively concrete in making steps uh, towards that. So, like all of these, we have very specific milestones we have to meet. We have no monetization at all. We don't sell anything. Everything we do is given away for free, um, and so the. The things that we're trying to do are uh, get users on this open science framework, the infrastructure tools that we use to have researchers be able to make their research more available, uh, make progress on getting uh, the community invested in some of these nudges and incentives. So we have particular programs like um, uh, this concept of rep registered reports, which is a different way of publishing uh, that shifts the incentive slightly, or badges uh, that journals can give in order to acknowledge authors who make their data open or their materials more available. Just little things that signal what the values are and what, when people are actually behaving according to those values. Uh, and just starting there, we're, we're very, you know, we're incremental revolutionaries. We're very willing to work with the system as it currently exists and then just push it to one step closer uh, to where we'd like to get, rather than Everyone has to do this thing, and we're going to finger shake at everybody saying, if you want to be a good person and a good scientist, you have to do these things. That's not going to work. Everybody is trying to do the best they can, surviving in a, a system that is the way it is. Uh, so changing a system uh, is not so uh, simple. So it's sort of uh, little nudges that we, we hope will accumulate into big changes. So how do you think about the Schmidt formula then? Please, no, this is great. This is great. Yeah, yeah, I'm happy. Yeah, and this is, I think, a key part of where the role we can play uh, for the center. It's, you know, why do it as a 501c3 with no, with deliberately no monetization <laughs> plans at all? Like, okay, you want to kill a business? This is how you do it, uh, <laughs> right? Uh, but the, you know, we sort of looked at what others were doing in this space, and there's a lot of great groups uh, building services on open science as a concept. Uh, doing different things across the research workflow, and we're very happy that there's a robust community uh, emerging working on those things. Uh, but there, uh, for all of these challenges, sort of the real ideals of science, right? Completely open, all access, no one's moving enough. <laughs> so I'll wave hello. This will be great on film. Oh, this is, uh, yeah, okay. <laughs> what, what? Uh, so. <laughs> <laughs> right. uh, the sort of if we really take those core values of science seriously and say that's we're just we, you know we may never meet the ideal but we're just going to keep aiming for it, uh, then adopting in, in where we sit in this, if we adopt a, a for-profit model or a model where the survival of the center is in the front rather than the mission. Uh, then at some point we would confront that decision where what's good for science is different than what's good for the center. Uh, and that would be a very hard choice to make given that we have a real investment in what the center is, right? And so all of the motivated reasoning and all those things could come to bear of confronting us with violating our mission. And the other organizations that are in this space are struggling with this because they're there for good, very good reasons, right? They're there because they want to make science better. They want to ha have an improvement, of course, and they want to make uh, a salary and a good career and everything else, just like scientists want to do this for themselves. Um, but the things that are monetizable and of value in science are things like the data. Uh, and once you say, we're going to monetize on the data, the way to do that requires violating the principle of openness, closing off access to it. 
Uh, and that is a really difficult thing if we're really pushing towards a fully open system. So our goal is to help this community of, uh, of um, open science organizations and services survive by us playing the role of make sure it's all open, make sure it's all connected, uh, and then you build services on top of that. Right? You have a particular expertise in that kind of data. Well, your organization can offer as a service your expertise. And people will pay for that because you provided some extra expertise. You might provide a specialized way in which to work with that data, uh, specialized tools for working that, analytic packages, visualization tools that people would be willing to pay some fee for. Uh, but the data will be open. Right? And so if we can make sure that the, sort of the core values of science are maintained or, or expand or promoted, uh, and then make it easy for services to build on top of that, provide value uh, so that they can create uh, effective monetization strategies, uh, then we feel like we'll play the, the role that we could play. The ultimate goal is to have it be so that it doesn't matter if the center continues to exist. So if we can build out a set of tools that are all free open source, that are a network of information like the internet, you know, no one owns the internet, it just is there. If we can facilitate the building of that concept uh, for scientific information, then the center can go away and that will still be maintained. At the same time, so this is going I guess in multiple directions, so it may spur uh, more que uh, questions. Uh, there, there may be a need for an organization like the center to continue to exist to help maintain uh, that kind of infrastructure. Um, and sort of the, so people ask, well, so how are you going to ensure your sustainability like for that? Like if, if it's really going to become the core infrastructure of science, then you have to have a sustainability plan. And my response so far has been, you know, we're two years in, who knows if this will work, is if it actually becomes core infrastructure for science, that that will cause the sustaining <laughs> because all of the organizations that have a stake in that infrastructure will say, we need to support this. Uh, and it doesn't mean support the center, it means support that infrastructure, whatever body and governance and everything else uh, is maintaining it. So if it doesn't work, it should die. Uh, and so the center shouldn't continue doing it because they took the wrong strategy. The concepts of creating a framework, making it really easy for people to share and maintain their data, make that available, uh, make sure that it's archived and sustainable and readable, all of the things that we're trying to build, those are, everyone thinks those are good ideas. It's not new ideas to us, it's not new ideas to others. People have been talking about these things for a long time. So it's not, is it a good idea or not? It's can we actually execute it in a way that builds it and makes it effective and useful? Um, and so then uh, the sustainability is a consequence of success. So I'll go there and then come back. Developing that. Yeah, no, excellent question. I don't think I have, uh, well, I, I can pull up slides, but I can just describe uh, to you. The, the goal of the OSF is to meet researchers where they are. So the problem that we start with solving is how we maintain our own data for our own use. So your lab may have the same challenges that I do, is that when people leave, a lot of information and knowledge and the ad hoc archiving and curation systems that each person has goes with them. And so recovering that study or that sequence of studies that was done six years ago becomes near impossible for us to use just for our own use. And so the open science framework can be used entirely privately. There's no requirement to make anything available at all to anybody. Uh, so you can use it entirely as an archiving system, a collaboration tool to manage your own data and materials for your own use. And then the decision to make parts of that available to others is a decision that the individual researcher or lab or team gets to make. Uh, so you can, for example, and this is, the, yours is a very good example of uh, based on the way that science works now, the data that we acquire is the data that's the basis for our career advancement and everything else. And so those that invest a huge amount of resources into acquiring that data will use it not just for one paper but for dozens uh, of papers. 
And so in those cases, the data set isn't likely to be made available uh, easily, or at least rapidly. Perhaps eventually, right? You have five years, you put enough into it, okay, now I'm ready to make it available. Uh, but you might be more willing to, for example, make the code book available so that others who are doing research in the area might see, very, oh boy, they collected these variables, I'm gonna contact them for a potential collaboration. Uh, because we've been looking at the same things in a separate longitudinal data set, and so we could see if it actually replicates in this particular investigation. Uh, you might be willing to make some of the workflow parts available, even if the data is, itself is not directly accessible. And so this, the framework just provides those options. Leave it closed, use it privately, maintain your workflow and all the things you're trying to do, uh, and then, if you wish, uh, make parts or all of that available at the schedule that you wish to do it. Uh, so that's sort of the base concept of how uh, we do it. And I can say more about how it all works and everything, but uh, that's the base idea, is don't require anyone to do anything other than what they're trying to do to succeed in their own research now. Provide value for that kind of research. Yeah. So we... Right, so, th so this is very important for just sort of the, our overall strategy, right? And so it's sort of three parts uh, to the strategy. One is that we're trying to build the tools to enable the, the universe of science to change. Uh, and then we have a lot of uh, efforts on training. What is it that I would need to do to document my, my stuff so that others could make use of it, right? The, we've talked a lot already in the libraries about how Librarians have a special set of skills uh, that researchers don't tend to have about curating things, anticipating that someone other than me is gonna look at this data set and how to make that so that it's possible to make good use of. Uh, so there's a lot of uh, effort there. And then the key part for this is instead of requirements, we can't require anybody to do anything, right? People just ignore us. Uh, but we can help facilitate the incentives to make change uh, desirable. So each researcher may idealize, yeah, it would be great just sharing everything and if I can continue to succeed and thrive in my career, yeah, of course I would share everything. Uh, but the reality is that that's not the case. I need to be able to have some degree of ownership, some degree of privacy, some degree of priority for different parts of the workflow. Uh, so if we can attend to how is it that we can make it in people's interest to make things more openly available so that they can live closer to those ideals that they would embrace should the marketplace uh, of science be one that reinforced and supported it. Uh, so that is the key part of this, right? So there's, uh, you know, the very simple things, right? When you make a project publicly available, it does things like counts page views and counts downloads, so you can see are people having an impact, right? It makes it easy to cite data or cite materials or cite other parts so that you can get more of the traditional credit for how people get credit for their research. Uh, it can support things like, uh, we, don't, we haven't implemented yet, but one of the things we'll uh, have is sort of this automated f uh, facilitation of making requests of people for uh, data. And so you as a researcher might say, I'm willing to share my data if we can do it collaboratively, right? So you might be very willing to say, look, I don't have enough people in the lab uh, to do all of the things I'm interested in doing. Others might have great ideas but I want to be a co-author, right? I want to have a chance to sort of contribute to that project because we put so much in this. So if we can facilitate that process where you make just enough information available so people can see, wow, that's a really interesting data set, and then have a request managing system so how people can get involved, right? That's another step towards openness. And so the requirements for openness have to come from the people that really have the levers. We don't have the levers. So, uh, you know, governments can require that, uh, funders can require that, and there's lots of movement uh, happening there. NIH uh, is getting closer, and many of the others are uh, funding agencies are getting closer to actually just saying, if you get money from us, you have to make your data available. End of story. Uh, so these types of changes are likely coming, so we want to provide a means to do that effectively, efficiently, and as much in the researcher's interest as possible. Useful, yeah, yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah, I think that's a, that's a great point, and it's exactly in how the, the answer can't just be, it all goes from all closed to all open, because uh, there's multiple factors involved in open. In fact, when you move to an open system, security becomes more important, not less important, uh, because it's so easy to inadvertently share things that really should not be shared, right? Like identifying information uh, that really would violate the, the, not just the privacy, but the ethics of actually doing this kind of research. Uh, so the system, you know, we, for just in terms of the technology, we pay a lot of attention to security of data so that if things are not shared, then they're not shared. Uh, and that has to be part of uh, the process. So our goal is simply change the assumption, the, def uh, the default assumption, to being open. And then have people be thinking, me as a researcher, be thinking about why shouldn't I make this open yet or at all. Uh, and there's lots of good reasons. They're not just rationalizations. There are active reasons about ethics and integrity and all of the things you described uh, that would delay or prohibit uh, things, making things openly available. But by changing the mindset to default is open uh, requires us to actually think those things through rather than just say, well, no one shares, so I don't even have to think about why should I share, uh, right? So that's really the base goal from our perspective. And then the other agencies and stakeholders involved are obviously actively working on how it is you can do these things ethically and otherwise. And we just want to make sure the system is sensitive uh, to that and those, those good reasons. Yeah, uh, it is a very diverse team in multiple ways because of those m many challenges. We have, at least in getting started, we have the advantage of, I, uh, until moving to psychology, I was a computer engineering major uh, for, until my fourth year of undergrad. Uh, and then Jeff, who's the co-founder, uh, got was a PhD in psychology, but he was a software developer beforehand. Uh, and my lab has always been technical. We've run a this thing called Project Implicit, which is a web-based data collection for a dozen years and uh, does a lot of uh, research, big data and everything else. Um, uh, so we had the facility to get started on the technology, uh, but you know, there's a lot more and you know, in some of the parts of training. Uh, and then the incentives actually tie into what our research interests are uh, from the lab. So we have sort of bits and pieces of all of them, but you know, I've I ran Project Implicit, which is a nonprofit, but it's not a nonprofit in the way that this is an organization. Right? We have 50 people almost on staff here. It's, it's an actual organization that requires everyday sort of working on things that I've never thought I would be doing as an academic. Um, so we've been uh, really looking to uh, recruit a team that has very complementary skill sets, both across all the sciences 
but then at the bridge of science and technology. And it was very surprising to me as we got further and further into this, uh, even though science and technology seem to be things that would be highly overlapping, in reality they aren't. Uh, there are very few groups that really n understand uh, both. Uh, and so tech, you know, the, the kinds of technology things that get developed in scientific laboratories tend to be very constrained. They're not thinking about scale. They're not thinking about extensibility. They're thinking about the scientific problem they're trying to solve. Uh, whereas those in technology tend to have lots of scale and extensibility and all, thinking about all of these things, but aren't applicable to the everyday need <laughs> of the individual researcher. Uh, and so really trying to pull people that can uh, help with that bridge has been real important. So in our initial hiring, we hired a PhD in neuroscience who was a software developer. We hired someone that came out of a, you know, biology that has uh, interests in technology. And so we were looking for people uh, that really have crossover knowledge to have at least an organizational understanding of all of that. Where we've been very uh, high need is on actual organizational practice uh, and effective running of an organization. 401ks, I know I, know I have one. What, what do you do with that? I don't know. Uh, so there are a lot of things that just on the ground trying to solve, we were not uh, immediately prepared uh, to do on, on the operational side. Uh, but uh, because we got a lot of uh, funding early, we've been able to be sort of assertive in saying, let's get a broad representation uh, as well as we can. So one of our community members uh, is uh, a PhD in chemical engineering, uh, and so she brings a wealth of knowledge about an area of research that we have very little uh, experience with. Uh, but because we're working at a level of abstraction on these problems uh, that are across science, uh, we're able to get a whole team with lots of different experiences in the sciences to work very closely on those big problems and then speak the language of the individual communities that we're trying to engage. And so that's been a real uh, advantage. For that. I don't know if that totally answers the question, but there it is. No, please. Go. So right now we have, and this, was, this is an interesting one where I'm curious of people's views on it because we decided we need to all be in the same place to start. We have such a strong mission focus. We have such an unusual set of things that we're trying to build in terms of a culture internally that then also gets exported externally that we need to have everybody in the same place. Yes, uh, so we, uh, you know, our, our software development practice, you know, so we have sort of two-week cycles, but they're not fixed. Uh, we have uh, stand-up each morning, which is five minutes, which is the entire team, uh, even the researchers and others, just to sort of understand what each other are doing. We have a, a model where we have three teams, the meta science, infrastructure, and community teams. Each of them have a planned meeting for an hour a week. Uh, where it's the check-in and updates, uh, and then uh, sometimes they'll have additional ones. But go ahead. No, that's a great yeah. <laughs> um, that to me is the biggest part of being a science and a subject is experience all the data inside of it and showing people how it happens. It does really, really, really well. I mean, it's just all the way you put it. Right. Anything. Right. There's that. And then the other side, you aren't, it doesn't sound like you're closely allied to a Northwestern University. Or Northwestern University in publishing. There's a lot of pushback towards the word open. Yes, <laughs> not to name any names. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm just wondering if you had any experiences or anecdotes about you know, somebody pushing back at conferences or, or bands, for instance. Yeah, or yeah. So, uh, yeah, there's lots of interesting things to say on the latter. And on the, on the former, um, the, uh, what we would 
we want to enable, and it's, it, the infrastructure doesn't do this well yet, uh, but where we're heading is to try to make it so that someone could make their entire workflow, sort of that lab notebook, sort of open as it happens. Uh, and I can easily imagine, you know, people starting to follow those that have a real interesting commentary on those qualitative aspects of just trying to figure this stuff out. Uh, and then learning from that, right? A lot of the learning of methodology in graduate training programs is about these are the meth this is how you do that statistic, this is how you perform that instrumentation, right? Real sort of concrete, just get this stuff done. Whereas a lot of the interesting reality of what gets learned in an active lab is seeing how your colleagues do the stuff, how they reason through it, all of this stuff you're mentioning. And so it'd be great to sort of surface that more, especially to be able to get uh, those that don't have that access point of a large active lab uh, with you know, uh, people that have been doing this for a long time, but give them a window uh, into learning from some of that tacit knowledge and inf information. Yeah. Right. Right. Talking about it, <laughs> right. Yeah, so whether, you know, but how many need to do it in order for the information value to be high, I don't know. Uh, but it isn't one where we're sort of saying we're going to do that, uh, but we are trying, thinking about that in terms of building the system. Yeah, right, yeah, and trying to pull that together. So we'd like the, uh, you know, the OSF to be like a replacement for people's websites and blogs and everything else, so there could be a consolidated environment where that happens. Yeah, we'll see. Um, so the second question is uh, resistance by publishers. Um, Feedback, a feedback, right. Uh, so th we've had a lot of uh, interesting interactions uh, with publishers and you know, the, the, this landscape is changing and publishers know better than anyone else uh, that it's changing and so they are thinking about lots of different ways to address how that will change and how they can uh, continue to survive and thrive in that. And we are by no means uh, anti-publisher at all uh, but we are pro the core principles of science and the current model uh, of publishing and scientific communication is very antagonistic to that core model which is close off access and charge people to obtain access to the, the outputs of scientific research. Um, so we had a few presentations like I did a webinar uh, with Elsevier's uh, future staff, you know, the team developing innovation and they're very interested. We've had lots of nice conversations uh, about some of these tools and directions. We are in a position, part of our model of having no monetization uh, and no ownership of intellectual property is that functionally we don't have any competitors. Uh, we can collaborate with anyone without any threat because if you build a tool that does that thing that we were hoping to build, then we'll just use your tool. Uh, we don't need to build it. That saves us time and we, we now have a nice connection. So we're very happy to be very approach oriented with any group um, regardless of their own strategy for trying to make it in the marketplace. Uh, and so that gives us, uh, we, we can be very open with what we're doing. We're gonna build this, we're gonna give it away. Uh, how about we work together so that you can, you know, extend it, do other things with it, whatever it is that you wanna do for your organization. Um, so there isn't active uh, partnership yet uh, in many of those, other than a very low scale, like at particular journals with particular editors rather than the organization. Uh, but there's, Progress, uh, cumulative progress, perhaps. So, you had a hand. Yeah, so going to the head question, um, do you have any issues in there, or are they simply, how did you set up that certification system? I mean, given that there are multiple open health and data repositories, how do you set up the grids to allow you to do that? That's, it's much easier to accept that over time. Yeah. Time, if you come to the systemic thing yeah. and say, here is Yeah, so the, um, the approach is, uh, I mentioned briefly before, so meet researchers where they are. So we want to provide value to researchers for doing the research as they do it now. And the uh, openness and reproducibility are side effect options. Uh, they're not requirements. 
And so the OSF, if it works, so I, I can probably jump ahead to some kind of uh, picture just to have a picture. Um, so the OSF intends to support the entire research workflow so that it is now the tool, and my lab uses it all now, is it's the way in which we manage our data and materials. And most of that is still private. So even for my lab, you know, we are staunch on the openness, we're going open. A lot of it is still private for many of the same reasons, right? Is some of it we cannot share. Uh, other parts, we're waiting for that grad student to be able to follow through with some of those projects when it's published. If we don't have uh, you know, obvious additional uses, we'll make things available, et cetera. Um, but if we can connect the various tools that researchers use across their workflow, their data analytics tools, their data visualization tools, the ways in which they push information into manuscript streams, if we can connect those together, then we can make researchers much more efficient in their own research for their own purposes. Uh, and so they get value regardless of whether they ever make anything open. So they don't have to embrace the ideals of open science to get value out of the tools. Uh, and so we want to make clear as our first step is this is useful for you in how you do your research now. But what, then what we do is we make it extremely easy to move towards open models and reproducible tools. So in the top corner of every project page, maybe I have a picture of a project page. Yeah, here's a project page. Top corner, there's a little button. This project is public, uh, but when it's not public, it has a little button that says make public. And if you click the button, it has a pop-up says, are you really sure you want to make this public? And you click yes, uh, and then that URL is now public. So we have uh, integrated the private workflow and the public workflow. Because right now, to make things available, I, uh, the way in which it works ordinarily is the paper's published, and then someone says, oh, can you share that data? And I think, no, I'm done with that. Uh, I finished the project. <laughs> Yeah, uh, and so, so we're trying to build tools. So when the data is available, so we have badges uh, that journals can award uh, and attach to articles when they have open data and open materials. And we have an open community that sort of defines the specifications for those badges. So if the journal adopts those badges, then the badge is attached to the article saying there is open data. And the badge is, in, is baked. So it has information about who the issuer is, who got, got issued to, what it got issued for, the DOI, if there is a DOI associated with it, and a link to the data. So the badge becomes a means uh, to identify and find that data. We can also work with publishers to surface when there are things in the OSF, because it all has permanent uh, unique identifiers, can surface when uh, there is data available with particular um, articles so that they can just have that right on the page. When you arrive at this uh, paper, you also see here's where the data are, here's where the materials are, et cetera. Yeah. Um, the badges, are they OBI compliant? OBI, I don't know what that is. <laughs> the Mozilla standard, yes. So they're uh, intended to be that way. There's still a couple of uh, finishing technical items uh, to resolve, but they are intended to be part of that um, of that approach. So are you getting are you getting good results from from using the badges, or are people still so we have. Uh, th there's variation, and it seems that just in the last couple of months, there is increasing interest. Because you know, we presented this first as badges, and you know, researchers are like, I don't need badges. I'm not a Girl Scout anymore. <laughs> like, come on. Uh, but, but part of the message that is much more effective, especially for journal editors, is that badges are signals. Mm -hmm. And researchers take signaling very seriously, which is if you want to signal what behaviors are desired, uh, then you need some means of knowing when the behavior is occurring. And so journals have a very easy thing of, we can, we can show that we care about openness uh, by offering badges as an option. We don't require open data. We're not ready to push that onto our, uh, our authors. But we are willing to have a little badge there that acknowledges when they meet open data standards. Uh, because that's pretty low risk. If authors don't care about it, then they won't apply for the badge. What, what cost is there? So getting journals to adopt that is a means for at least providing an opportunity to signal when it happens. And then when you signal that it is occurring, right? if authors start to take that up, then other authors that don't do that look and say, oh, well, my argument that it's, no one's doing it is false. There are people doing it. Uh, and my argument that it's too hard to do, uh, maybe that's not true, because there's clearly other people doing it. And so it opens up the opportunity for rapid change in norms because you've now signaled very clearly 
uh, that this is occurring uh, and can expand. We have one journal that has been using the badges uh, for close to a year now, Psychological Science. Uh, and about 25% uh, of, submit, it's between 20 and 25%, 25, 20 to 25% of articles that are accepted in the journal in this past uh, year have applied for uh, badges and received at least one. We have three different uh, badges. Uh, so that's actually much better than I thought it would be as a, just an initial onset. Uh, so we'll see how that continues to grow. And then there are more journals that are getting ready to adopt those. So, yeah, please. Uh, so the f users of the Open Science Framework is at uh, probably close to 6,500 now. Uh, so we're adding about 15 a day. Um, year one, fantastic. <laughs> uh, depth users is much lighter than that. So one of the big focuses of the next three-month cycle is providing a lot of means of getting people to actually invest uh, in the technology. Because people will register and say, oh, that looks interesting. I don't know how to use it. Uh, and then I'll come back to it later. Uh, and so it is easy to use, but we're not communicating that as effectively yet as we'd like to. Uh, and so we'll do some more. That will be a big uh, focus to increase that. Um, 